All rise. The Chief Judge and the Associate Judges of the United States Court of Military Appeal. Harry, Harry, Harry. The Honorable, the United States Court of Military Appeal is now open and in session. God save the United States of America and this honorable court. There are no motions this morning, and so we will proceed to hear argument in the United States against Reichenbach. Is counsel ready for appellant? You're reserving five minutes for rebuttal. Ten minutes, sir. Ten. Fine. Proceed. May it please the court, your honors. I am Captain William E. Boyle, and I'm here on behalf of the appellant, Airman Brian F. Reichenbach. This case is a case of first impression for the Court of Military Appeal, as it was for the Court of uh, Air Force Court of Military Review. The ultimate issue here deals with the applicability of the Controlled Substance Analog Act, enacted in 1986, to Article 112A, Uniform Code of Military Justice. At trial, the appellant pled guilty to a variety of drug offenses. He also pled guilty on a conditional basis to the additional charge and specification one and two, which dealt with the question here today, which is designer drugs. The, the, the uh, street name for the specific designer drug in question is ecstasy. Pharmacologically speaking, it's referred to as 3,4-methylene-dioxymethamphetamine, but for the purposes of discussion today, it'll be just simply referred to as either ecstasy or MDMA. <clears throat> Your Honor, the, the government uh, prosecuted uh, the case under the typical uh, Article 112A of UCM, UCMJ, uh, which incorporates control substances. What is peculiar about this is that the act, the, uh, which I will refer to as the Analog Act, deals with something that really isn't a controlled substance. It is referred to as a controlled substance analog. The controlled substance analog was appropriately defined in uh, 21 U.S.C. section 802 paragraphs A and B, and it's very lengthy, but basically a controlled substance analog is a substance having a chemical structure and effect on the nervous system substantially similar to that of a Schedule I and II controlled substance. Furthermore, in the definition, it goes on to say that a controlled substance analog cannot be a controlled substance. There's a fine distinction. And what's going to occur during the process of this is that certain key words and definitions are very important to determine whether or not 112A really allows an a, a offense to be prosecuted with the idea of the Analog Act being the moving aspect of the case. Now, at some time, MDMA has been scheduled by the uh, administrator of DEA, correct? That is correct, sir. So at that, at that point, under the definition, which says that a controlled <coughs> substance cannot be an analog or vice versa. Mm -hmm. At that point, MDMA could no longer be prosecuted as an analog. It would have to be pro prosecuted as a scheduled item. Yes, one of the controlled schedules, either one or two normally, or one through five at least. That is correct. If, in fact, the appropriate uh, DEA regulations had been met along the period during uh, to temporarily schedule and to finally schedule it, uh, we probably wouldn't be here. But there was so much uh, discussion and debate as to whether the DEA was properly temporarily scheduling and, and later to finally schedule this thing to make it a co controlled substance that uh, all of this has come about because the, the government, uh, it's a contention of the defense, uh, that they pursued this case knowing about these cases, that they pursued the cases under the theory that it was an analog and not a controlled substance. And the, the key ultimate issue is whether 112A allows that type of prosecution. Well, let me ask this. They, as I recall, in the specification alleged, uh, what is it, uh, 21 U.S.C. 813, the, the provision on the analog or design of drug enforcement act? Yes, sir. That's actually there in the specification as such. That is correct. Uh, doesn't that 
change the situation somewhat? In other words, even if it didn't come in under 112A, wouldn't that be picked up under the general article, Article 134, and uh, it would be just a matter of misdesignation of the charge? Well, I don't think so, Your Honor. Uh, when the uh, UCMJ was modified in 1984, it did away with uh, bringing charges under Article 134 and uh, establishing absolutely a new article under 112A, which I believe is, uh, uh, let's see, um, I, I forget the exact uh, USC uh, site on that. But it was that preempted, I believe, and I would stand on that position, anything being brought uh, under 134. So you're saying that given the presence of uh, Article 112A, the government is precluded from doing that which we, they could have done before that particular provision. Yes, that's enacted. the position. Yes, sir. I'm a little bit confused, Captain. If this was a controlled substance, then you could prosecute it under 112A. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And if it was an analog, you, pro you could prosecute it as a violation of <clears throat> 813. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That, that's the gist of the legislation. The article, uh, rather, uh, Section 813 so came... Both both controlled substances and analogs are unlawful to possess. Yes, that's, that has been the theory of the legislation that was enacted in 1986. Okay. The whole theory came about because of the, the, of the problem that was arising during the, uh, the, the delay period between finding out whether a substance should be controlled and was a, a drug of uh, high abuse and uh, the, the, the applicability or rather the, uh, the ability of chemists uh, people in the know who could molecularly tinker with substances to change them so they would have a similar effect, whether it be uh, on an amphetamine base, uh, speed, or a hallucinogen. They would tinker with it to such a degree, it could even be just a <coughs> one minor molecular change, that it would no longer be a controlled substance pharmacologically. And uh, this is what happened. So what happened, theoretically, is that there were new drugs coming about having almost the same effect for all intents and purposes, but it was no longer a criminal offense, and people were getting away with it. So the legislation came about in an effort to have a catch-all statute. So, geez, we have this mechanism to try to put it in a controlled status, but we need and is a, an important desire to try to prohibit this kind of uh, conduct and mischief. So uh, the enactment of uh, the Controlled uh, Substance Analog Enforcement Act came about in 86. But by its definition and terminology, which I might add also at this time has been changed uh, in recent reenactment or amendment, uh, was extremely vague and uh, left the, the question as to what an analog was up to the experts to determine during the course of a court martial or other trial for that matter. Counsel, to get it down to the simple terms here. Yes, sir. Uh, this guy used and distributed a, a pill, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, this pill was was something that that uh, in the record at Appellate Exhibit Five, uh, there's a, a stipulation of, of of testimony of of a uh, an expert in drugs. Frank Sapienza, I believe. Yes, yeah, Sapienza. And he says, a user of ecstasy would see colors brighter. You feel things better. You have, uh, uh, you, you, you have mild hallucinations. You have rapid heartbeat, rapid pulse rate, anxiety, insomnia. Uh, it's kind of like LSD. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if, if he pled guilty, in which he did in this case, to amphetamines, to, to use, an, we wouldn't be here today. It's only because it was an amphetamine that, that somebody attached something else, out, another chemical substance to no, it. No, 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 sir, that's incorrect. No. Okay. It, it's very difficult for myself and anyone who's not a chemist to understand this, but I think for the purpose of uh, simple layman's discussion, it's not like if you had a stew and you added a little extra something else, a different ingredient to make it something else. All right. This is molecular tinkering, okay, really so, changing the so chemical. So they tinkered with the, the molecules in the stool, in the stew. Yes. That didn't make it uh, harmless. It, it made it actually another 
mm -hmm. si kind of drug that made people synthetic see something else. things in bright colors. And, and this guy was working in a tactical reconnaissance wing. What if he was a mechanic and, and he was supposed to be seeing the different colors on the, the, the tools uh, to, mm -hmm. to fix the engine? I mean, there, there's no question. I, I don't just, just because we, we take a drug and maybe put chocolate on it. It doesn't make any, we, we call it an M&M, doesn't make it not chocolate anymore. If chocolate is prohibited and we, we put a sugar coating around it or change the molecules and it still has the effect of a drug, an illegal drug, is this not an illegal act? Only if the laws that we have that have been enacted are properly placed on the record and they're properly criminalized. Now, is not 18 U.S.C. 813 a flexible law, a law that Congress enacted uh, knowing that, that we have basement chemists designing, as soon as a, a, desug, a drug becomes prohibited, they go back to the basement and they design a new kind of molecule which gives you the same or better effect, but is not the name that's listed on this thing. Well, there's, there's no question that there was a legitimate and bona fide good purpose for having the legislation, but it was so general in nature that it has really very seldom been used, even in the United States District Courts, to enforce. And there have been very few cases, as a matter of fact, where uh, during the appellate process and this and some other cases that are yet to come before this court, where we could look to as appellate counsel and say this has been handled or decided before. They have not utilized 813. In fact, uh, there's probably not one that I can provide the court at this time uh, and <coughs> cite it, actually. Well, Captain Boyle, let me just yes, ask, sir. let me ask you a question. As I understand Article 112A, no matter how dangerous the substance, no matter how hallucinogenic the substance, unless it is a controlled substance, it is not unlawful to possess it under 112A. Is that your argument? That's the general gist of it, yes, sir. And analogs are not unlawful under 112A. Yes, sir. That's, That's the contention and, and in fact this particular... In other words, 813 by its definition doesn't make that It's not broad, broadly sweeping enough to inclu include it in the Armed Forces uh, legislation, which is 112A, <clears throat> the article. In looking at 112A specifically, it's broken down into several categories and uh, they're listed uh, and generally, uh, even in the analysis under the, the manual for course marshals, they talk about just listing like opium and some other cocaine and some other things just generally because commanders would have to be able to deal with these things without having necessarily the, in the field uh, to know what is a controlled substance and having all the pharmacological names, et cetera, to look up. Uh, so they just generally list them. There's also a category that would really be a controlled substance list provided by the president it's not included in anything that I've seen that would name it, certainly during the time of this particular case. And the third definitely deals with uh, 21 U.S.C. Uh, 812, which is the listing, all the schedules. And uh, that, this was an argue, argument that had been brought before the Court of Military <coughs> Review, uh, Air Force Review, in uh, U.S. versus Tyhurst, which is yet to come before the court as such. And the uh, same particular issues were involved in that. And uh, the court uh, decided in that particular case that the scope of 112A was not broad enough to sufficiently permit uh, enforcement of Section 813. There was nothing in the legislative history. There was nothing in the enactment of 1984's manual to include that. It didn't exist. Uh, and uh, just recently, because I know counsel is going to bring it up, uh, was an attempt in the uh, government's position is that perhaps the analog is really a derivative and therefore included in provision number one under article 112, uh, I'm sorry, 112A. Well, if that be the case, is there any evidence in the record? No, sir. No, sir. This appellate the, exhibit that Judge Sullivan made reference to does not uh, talk about it being There's a not a word anywhere in that that I can recall that talks about the term derivative. And not only that, sir, uh, Judge Castle, who wrote the opinion in United States versus Tyhurst uh, that addressed the, this particular issue, made a comment, and I'm just going to try to paraphrase what, what he basically said, is that there was nothing that he could perceive uh, as to whether derivative really was an analog 
or an analog was a derivative and his understanding of it and trying to fathom out what was an analog, a controlled substance analog. The definition of itself that's contained in 802 is somewhat broad but gives a general gist, but it doesn't get down to the real uh, chemistry that really was required of, a, of someone with uh, that kind of expertise. But he indicated that the government wasn't able in that case to sustain or prove and made a very important comment that if it was so simple to allow it to be deemed to be a derivative, why in the world did the legislature go ahead and enact using a term analog when they had another word that maybe have been broader? So the language is very critical here. And we, again, submit that it just wasn't broad enough to, to sustain a, a punishable offense under 112A. So it is your position, then, that on 25 May 1988, it was lawful in the Air Force. 20, what, what I'm sorry, that? 1 February 87. I was looking at the court-martial date. I apologize. Okay. On 1 February 1987, and 19 September 1987, during that period, it was lawful for an airman in the United States Air Force to possess and use ecstasy. Yes, sir. It was not controlled at that time. Okay. There was That's your one, position. one case. Uh, uh, it was not controlled, and it was not. Uh, it was not a controlled substance at that time, and uh, it also was supported by the fact that the entire case was brought under the guise of using the Analog Act. Uh, so Isn't that because of uh, cases like the Spain case where very circuit courts had held that it was not properly scheduled, so yes. the uh, person who drafted the charge was trying to find a different route instead of relying on a schedule? Yes, sir. Also, there was a case that came about, uh, which was the, uh, uh, the Greenspoon versus uh, DEA administrator, which challenged the final order that was placed by DEA. They went through their normal procedures. Uh, and placed a final order saying that MDMA, ecstasy, uh, should be a Schedule I controlled substance. Uh, Lester Greenspoon, who is a, a psychiatrist who was doing some testing, challenged that. And the court came back basically saying uh, that uh, they didn't consider everything appropriately and that the procedures were, again, incorrect, and they vacated the order. As a subsequent reaction to that, the DEA physically removed D, uh, the, uh, the language of control, the MDMA as a controlled substance from the books. They, they took it off the temporary it, schedule. No, correct. no, a final schedule, sir. But isn't it now on the, on the permanent schedule? Yes, sir. But they, <coughs> what they did is they reevaluated it, and they considered additional aspects, and they went ahead and put it back. And as of, as of uh, the 23rd March of 1988, it is, and as of this time, remains a controlled substance. But at the time, uh, I think it was 1 February of 87 through 19 September of 87. It wasn't a controlled substance. And if uh, the line of thought from the Tyhurst uh, decision is appropriate and it's not sufficiently broad, 112A can't support an analog prosecution in the military. And therefore, there is no chargeable offense, uh, at least during that period of time. Now, anything that occurs at this time is certainly it's a controlled substance. But at the time concerning this particular appellant, uh, there's a, a big question on whether it was a, an offense at all. Now, but your client didn't come in here. Uh, he came into the, the trial court, the court martial, and, and he pled guilty to use and, and distribution of ecstasy, didn't Conditional he? Conditional guilty plea, sir. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he didn't say, now listen, I think this ecstasy isn't, you know, isn't a bad stuff. I mean, uh, it wasn't a conditional plea, was it? Yes, sir. It was yes, it was. It was preserved. And, and what was the condition upon he pled? Uh, about the, uh, the fact it was not listed on the controlled substance list? Well, there were some arguments, and I, I don't recall exactly what they were by defense counsel. I'd have to look at that. But uh, I know that that was a subject as to whether or not it was a viable drug or whether there was an offense. Uh, if I remember it correctly, I'm counsel on some other cases as well. Uh, there was a motion to uh, have that particular offense dismissed, which the court, uh, the trial judge, said no to. So it, would, was, it was in the record, sir. Yeah, okay, but I would be more sympathetic to your, you know, Congress has, has tried to be flexible in, 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 
in combating designer drugs, which are invented even as we speak. I'm sure some drug dealer is, is hired a chemist uh, or, or someone to design a new drug, which we don't even know the name of it yet. I be, would be more sympathetic if ecstasy, which is uh, a designer drug based on or an analog uh, of amphetamines, uh, if, if it made it harmless, if it made him do his job better or uh, made him smarter or something. But, but it did, the, the record, uh, appellate exhibit five, you know, indicates that there was uh, expert testimony that, that this drug was a dangerous drug, a drug that should be criminalized mm -hmm. and that we, it has no business in the Air Force. And, and also, what if your guy was a civilian? Uh, 813 would certainly apply and make ecstasy a, a criminal offense. Is if, that right? If they used it to, um, to, to prosecute, I would think that there would be it, some it, challenges it, concerning And why other should issues. we let your guy off just because he's in the military when we prosecute the guy for the same offense if he's in the civilian? Just to, to try to answer you. The military. Continue to answer, th yeah. Thank you, Your Honor. Under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the military has its own set of rules, and some of which are, are different than the, than the uh, civilian counterpart. Uh, being late to work uh, has a serious repercussion on occasion, so there are certain types of offenses that are particular to the military, and everyone recognizes that. On the same footing, sir, an offense, whether it be in the civilian community, tribal and federal court or a state court or in a, a court-martial situation requires the legislation to properly be enacted to make an offense an offense, an appropriate offense. And that's the due process considerations that we must maintain. And that's the entire basis what we have here, although it's not in the brief, but that's the underlining thing here. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily what he did was certainly morally correct or legally right. Maybe uh, any person who does something of this nature to infiltrate their body with some kind of substance that may or may not have a good effect or not, uh, in order for our system, whether it be the military or otherwise, it has to be an appropriate criminal act, properly legislated, properly proceeded upon, and no matter what anyone else perceives it as being good or bad, not until society gives its final blessing to it in the, in the form of legislation will it allow a court to uphold it. Well, that's what, after consideration with my brothers, we will decide today. Thank you, sir. Thank you for Thank a good you. argument. May it please the court, I'm Major Catherine Taylor representing the government in this case. Before I get into the substance of the argument, I would like to say that this is the last opportunity I'm going to have to appear before this court as I have switched jobs already in, in the Washington area. It's been both an honor and a privilege appearing before you three gentlemen, and I thank you for making it so in the cases I've argued before you. Well, we're always happy to hear from a fine officer of the court like you. You've always presented an excellent argument. We look thank you, Judge to Everett. Today. Major the Taylor, before you start your argument. <laughs> Um, the defense claims that it was lawful for a member of the Air Force to possess ecstasy between, seven t between February of 87 and September of 87. Was ecstasy a controlled substance at that time? The government would contend that it was not. It was not properly on the list. Okay, so it was not on the list. So under the plain word of Article 112A, is there any word in there that we can hang our hat on? <laughs> Because it talks about controlled substances, doesn't it? Yes. Now, I would contend that the language that we can lay our hat on is we can lay our hat on 37, paragraph 37A, B, section 1, which talks about, which says opium, heroin, cocaine, amphetamine, LSD, methamphetamine, phencylcycline, barbiturate acid, and marijuana, and any compound or derivative of any such substance. The government would contend that this drug could be prosecuted as a derivative of this, of the Let substance. me ask you this. I just, uh, I'm not a chemist, I have no pharmacological background, but is there any testimony in the record or any stipulation where somebody who is an expert who would know these things said this is a derivative? There's not words that say this, is, this was a derivative. There is, there is testimony in the record from Mr. Sapenzi in, in Appellate Exhibit 5, which lays out the, skelet, the uh, chemical skeletons of amphetamine, metamphetamine, both MDA and MDMA, with which we're talking about in this case. And there are also 
In the uh, Tyhurst case, which uh, Major, excuse me, Captain Boyle referred to, that lists out some definition of derivative. Well, let me ask this. Was this a trial with, uh, with court members? No, it wasn't. It was judge alone. Or right. did the judge make any finding that it was a derivative? No, he did not, Your Honor. Did anybody argue that it was a derivative at trial? That was not the basis the government proceeded on at trial. So if we affirmed on the basis you now mentioned, we would have to do something which the government did not argue at trial, as to which the judge made no findings, and we, in effect, would have to become a chemist or pharmacologist and say that ecstasy is a derivative of amphetamine. Is that about it? No, I don't agree that that's the case, Your Honor, because I think that we can, we can get definitions of derivative derivatives. You know, the government cons contends in in Tyhurst, Judge Castle said that he didn't think we could, the government should be able to prosecute under derivatives because he didn't, because why would the government need it to do the Analog Control Act if, if we, if we uh, already were able to prosecute under derivatives? The prop, the, uh, well, let me thing just ask you a quickie in here. Has the government under, before the uh, Analog uh, Act, the Design of Drug Enforcement Act, has the government ever prosecuted ecstasy as a derivative of amphetamine or in any of the states like California, which have statutes dealing with derivatives, has it ever been prosecuted as a derivative? Not that, I, not that I'm aware of, Your Honor. I've so we would really be making very new law if we held that it was a derivative. Well, the, the statute that we've got for the military under 112A is totally different than, what, than the derivative under 21 U.S.C. 812. 21 U.S.C. 812 does not allow prosecution for derivatives. It talks about salts and isomers, and you look up those definitions. I'm certainly not a chemist either, but those, you know, those are not a derivative. You look up the definition of derivative, uh, Webster's Third International Dictionary says derivative is a chemical substance that is so related structurally to another substance as to be theoretically derivable from it, even when not so obtainable in practice, or a, sub a substance that can be made from another substance in one or more steps. In the Rickett case, which is talked about in Tyhurst, defines derivative as any substance prepared from that drug which chemically resembles that drug and which has some of the adverse effects of that drug. And what the court really held is important is the overall chemical similarity of the product to the parent. And that's exactly what we've got here. If you look at, at Appellate Exhibit 5, I believe it's page 2, the uh, stipulated expected testimony by Mr. Sapensia, you've got MDMA, you've got a nitrogen um, nitrogen group added, and that's the only difference between MDMA, the drug we've got in this case, and methamphetamine. And, and doesn't Sapiens at page two of Appellate Exhibit 5 uh, indicate that it is a, a quote, con control substance analog? He indicates it's a control substance analog. Yes, Your Honor. He also says... I mean, I mean, he, he says it, and, and this is expert in the record, which this court could take notice of. Well, the idea, though, that a controlled substance analog is an alternative to rather than a derivative. So if it's a controlled substance analog, then it's not a derivative. Isn't that the, isn't that the purport of that? Because I understood it, they would be mutually exclusive. A controlled substance analog is not, cannot be on the control, is not, cannot be placed, it's not on the Controlled Substance Act under 21 U.S.C. 812. Is it unlawful under the Uniform Code of Military Justice to possess and use a controlled substance analog? Yes. That's the government's contention. It would be unlawful under... Under what theory? Under if it's the, not a controlled substance, it doesn't that's come... That's correct. On, it doesn't come, by definition, it's not a controlled substance. So by definition, it doesn't come under 112A. That's correct. Where does it come? Well, it could come as a derivative under this section that I'm talking about, under okay. 37AB1. One is a derivative. The government would also contend that it could come under, as it was charged in this case, under 21 U.S.C. 813. And is, is, is that not uh, the, the, the case that was presented at trial for the government? And that is the case that was presented at trial for the government. It, I mean, it was you know. charged in the in specification that ecstasy was a controlled substance to re, uh, analog uh, pursuant to 18 U.S.C. 813. 21 U.S.C., Your Honor. Uh, yes. Or 21 uh, 813, I'm sorry. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, yes, and the government contend that well, 21 U.S.C. 813 you know, states a controlled stu substance analog shall be treated for the purposes of the Controlled Substance Act as a Schedule I controlled substance. 
21 U.S.C. 813 clearly indicates analogs are to be prosecuted as a Schedule I controlled drug and that it applies to 21 U.S.C. 812 Schedule I and II drugs. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, shouldn't that be prosecuted under Article 134 under the third clause, crimes and offenses not capital? No, Your Honor, we'd argue preemption prohibits that because you've got Article 112A specifically dealing with charging um, drugs in the military and the prior preemption, we couldn't get to Article 134. Well, wouldn't you be, what, uh, I mean, I think the defense is going to come in at trial. If the government tries to prosecute under 134, the defense is going to come in and argue preemption. Why do you concede pre preemption? I, I realize they would argue that under that line of cases, but given con congressional intent, to expand the coverage of the interdiction of drugs, uh, wouldn't it seem that they certainly would not have intended by Article 112A to, pro to immunize conduct which otherwise could be prosecuted? We don't agree that it can't be charged under 112A properly, though. Pardon me? I said we don't, do, we don't agree that it can't be charged under 112A. No. If we, if we, if, we if, I thought in your argument you also relied in part on 21 U.S.C. 813. So you're saying that uh, 21 U.S.C. 813, the Controlled Substances Analog Act, is included in 112A? It's not included, I'm saying 21 U U.S.C. 813 modifies 21 U.S.C. 812, which is included under 112A. All is 21 U.S.C. 813 is doing is saying drugs which are already listed as a controlled substance, if they've got the chemical similarity and the pharmacological similarity or are represented to have a pharmacological similarity, then they should be treated for the same purposes as controlled substance drugs. So you're saying that it's a modification by implication of Article 112A by the Design of Drugs Enforcement Act. Is there anything in the legislative history of that act which even adverts to uh, Military Justice or Article 112? There's nothing that's specific. There's nothing that specifically. No, there's no, there's not. You know, there's nothing that specifically ties in 813 to the military. But if you look at the the legislative history of the uh, act, was as Judge Sullivan said earlier, it's a case is to keep these backstreet chemists from going out and changing the, changing one of the molecules in the drug, and so we don't have it. So we have um, legal drugs now. Change get an illegal. illegal, illegal a legal drug, change one molecule, and we now get a legal drug. You know, the, that's the purposes of the act, which is the legislative history clearly indicates. Um, the act was also changed. 21 U.S.C. 813 was changed on 18 November 88, which indicates that the purpose of the statute was, applied to all federal, was to apply to all federal law. In looking at the intent and purpose of 21 U.S.C. 813 as it was before this court, I think we can also look to enactments that later, as they changed the act, and I think that tends to show that the purpose of that act was to incorporate all federal law of which the military recognizes. The military doesn't have to separately incorporate Article 813. Um, the history and subsequent enactments show that 813 was to affect all the federal law. It's a modification to the law that the military has already assimilated. We're not talking apples and oranges in this case. We're talking apples and a change to the apple. You, you were unable to convince the Air Force Court of Military Review of this position, weren't you? That's correct, Your and, Honor. Uh, are those cases certified up here? Yes, they are. Ty Hurst and Ty Hurst and Lofton. So the Air Force Court has already held that this is not a derivative, nor is it punishable under 112 as an analog, is that right? One, one panel of the Air Force Court two, has. Two, two of the judges. Two there of the judges a, on one panel, yes, Your Honor. among the one of them. And this, just, just for interest, this case was affirmed below I understand, and a per curiam in a short one yes. line. Not that I think that's going to help a whole lot. But. Counsel, in the analysis <laughs> of uh, 112A, uh, doesn't the analysis refer to uh, 21 U.S.C. 802? Yeah. For example, uh, this definition uh, talking about manufacturing control substance, this definition was taken from 21 U.S.C. 802.14. So, I mean, Congress evidently was aware when they made this flexible uh, thing under 13, they were aware that, uh, you know, the, that Article 112A was, was aware that it would be flexible to, to combat the designer drugs manufactured every day. And is that not your position? That, that, that the intent of Congress is manifest here and, 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 and that 
uh, that uh, 21.8.13 does, does refer back and, and in fact it, it can be the basis for prosecution? Yes, sure. We, we've got evidence in the record uh, from a, a drug expert uh, that, that ecstasy is, is a, uh, an, a chemical, is, is an analog, uh, and as, as such is a controlled substance. And then we've got the legislative history as well as the wording of the statute. That, that's right, Your Honor. Basically, that is. You know, not only do you have the um, testimony from the expert that it is an analog, you also have the chemical drawings of structures on you know, page 2 of the appellate exhibit 5 that specifically shows that MDMA has got the exact same skeleton of metamphetamine in it, the exact same with only the addition of the one grouping. Which is one of the definite, which is one of the definitions of a derivative by the Webster's Dictionary I quoted, and in the Rickett case, you know, you've got the same chemical similarity. Plus, you've got the evidence of Mr. Sapenzia stating that this can be um, changed into MDMA just with one or two with one or two molecular changes. Is there any medical use for the ecstasy? Not that, not not that's been found. No, it's Your in Honor. the record. No, not no. Mr. Sapenzia states there's been no medical. What about the psychiatrist that was fighting the DEA on it? He wouldn't agree with that, would he? No, but since that time, also MDMA MDMA is now as a Schedule One controlled substance, which is you know certainly found that there's no medical use for it. It was placed on there in March of '88. It was on and off the schedule. It was temporarily <laughs> placed on the schedule. Then it was permanently placed on the schedule, and then it was temporarily extended on the schedule, and then the Grinspoon vacated the permanent placement on the schedule. In the other line of cases, of Spain, Ho, VPs, they all found that the temporary placement was erroneous, with it, not because of it shouldn't have been on the schedule, but because of an improper delegation of power to the uh, administrator of DEA from the Attorney General. The Chief. Also a question about whether they used the 30-day notice period. That's correct. That, uh, that was one of the, case, one of the cases back. held that. Yes, Your Honor. Well, let me ask you this. Assuming that uh, the accused were to uh, go on post today and walk in here with uh, some ecstasy, uh, he could be convicted under Article 112A without regard to 21 U.S.C. 813, right? I mean, it's on the schedule right Yes, he now. could. Today he could. And has been. But and it would not be an analog. He that's correct. He could not be prosecuted under 21 U.S.C. 813. So we're we're concerned with what his legal status was during this period of time when the schedule did not include MDMA. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, and isn't, isn't this a conflict really between the criminal law, so hopefully we have some common sense legislators out there passing viable and constitutional and proper criminal laws, with administrative law, that is, whether the name ecstasy or Eve or crank or crack or something is going to be on some list kept by FDA at a particular time and place, and isn't that really the, the uh, uh, one of the basic conflicts here? Yes, yes, Your Honor. You know what we, the government's not going to have a problem prosecuting MDMA in the future because as of March of '88, you know it w it was on the controlled substance list and. Best of all, I can tell, there have not been any, nobody's um, complained that it was on there improperly and nobody's tried to get, get it off again. What, what we're also looking at here today is, you know, any other analogs, any other changes that we're going to have, you know, next time somebody goes, you know, backs into their basement, this is apparently quite an easy, quite an easy thing to do, um, you know, as all the uh, documentation on the appellate exhibits say about how easy it is to go through and just change these chemicals. So the next time we come up, you know, with a different, with a variation of ex, with a variation of ecstasy or a variation of MDA, you know, how's it going to be? How's the government going to charge it then? Are they going to be able to charge it under the Analog Control Act? Are they going to be able to charge it as a derivative? Are they going to have to charge? Are they just going to not be able to charge it until it's placed on the well, schedule? You know, I don't know why the government concedes that our or, or would argue that eight, uh, I'm sorry, that 112A preempts a prosecution for these dangerous drugs under 134. Uh, Judge Sullivan 
made an excellent point that someone under the influence of this whose colors are distorted, who has to deal with electronic wiring of various colors, might crash an airplane. And certainly nothing would be more prejudicial to good order and discipline than that. Why couldn't this be saved under 134 in any event if it's that dangerous a drug? Because we don't think you have to take that step to get to 134. But if we think we have to, could we? <laughs> if, if you think you have to, yes. Okay. So you, you would say there are some drugs which may not be an analog or a schedule which nevertheless could be proved by beyond a reasonable doubt to be so dangerous as to be prejudicial to good order and discipline. If they're not a derivative either under uh, the paragraph 37AB. I mean, somebody may come up with blowfish poison or something that really puts you way out. It's not a derivative of anything. Mm -hmm. Couldn't that be prosecuted on 134? Yes. It's with you know, going through the proper channels. Just like marijuana was initially? Initially, yes. Judge, uh, so. uh, Cox's question sort of implies a prosecution under the first two clauses of uh, Article 134, which calls, which would require findings of service discrediting conduct and uh, conduct prejudicial to good order and discipline. I'm still a little concerned as to why the government uh, would take, would concede basically that Article 112A, which was designed to facilitate prosecution of controlled substances, uh, would have the effect of displacing a later statute dealing with controlled substances analogs, given the third clause of Article 134, which basically says that any non-capital federal crime under Title 18 or otherwise, or, tw or Title 21, is incorporated in the UCMJ. I, uh, I can't quite understand that concession. Well, I think it's that very incorporation and the modif and how 813 for the federal sector modifies 21 U.S.C. 812. Why our argument is that that's that's incorporated in through 112A, and you don't have to get to that other step. You know the, that they just they kind of go hand in glove together. With 813 is only modifying things that are already on the schedule that the government has already recognized on the schedule. Every time the every time the federal government goes and changes that Controlled Substance Act and puts another drug on Schedule One or Schedule Two, we the government the air, air, the military does not have to go back out and recognize that, saying, "Oh, put in our legislative history, we're going to agree that we adopt that particular drug they just added." But Congress did it. They did it in the in the civilian realm in a way different from what you're suggesting. They didn't put in the schedules. They got five schedules, as I recall. Right. They did not say that an analog of an item in Schedule 1 is ipso facto in Schedule 1 or uh, in That's similar. Correct. What they did was enacted a separate statute dealing with analogs. Now, in the military, you've got a statute dealing with controlled substances. Congress, for whatever reason, didn't change that. and. Uh, isn't, isn't there a real question as to whether if Congress didn't choose to change it, whether this court has the power to rewrite Article 112A and uh, fill in the gap? Uh, and isn't it uh, much more logical to approach it in terms of Article 134 if it's coming in at all? No, Your Honor, I, I don't agree with you on okay. that, and the government doesn't agree, and that's all not right. been our position. Is your position that tw uh, uh, Article 112A says you can't use or distribute controlled substances, basically. Correct. And and, and and in that it says controlled substance uh, on a list that the president, you know, or, or it refers to a list the president can ex expand. Yes. So so there's flexibility built into there. That's correct. They say, well, this is not an all-inclusive list. It's going to be expanded. Then Congress over here. Uh, makes uh, not only 812, but 813. 812 has the list that can be expanded under 811. Right. The Attorney General, you know, under proper delegations can add to that list. And then it goes even further because we get further and further down uh, our history of our country and we see more, perhaps they see more designer drugs. So they say, they enact 813, it says a controlled substance analog shall be treated, blah, 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 for, for the purposes of any federal law, which would include the, the military criminal law, 
as a controlled substance in Schedule One. But that's not the that's not the uh, section of 813 that we're dealing with at the time. This this. Well, I know that was enacted in '86, amended in, in November. '88. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay, that provision but, is only as of '88. Right. The uh, just just the uh, of any federal law. What they did was the first the 813 originally says for the purposes of this title and Title Three, and they changed that language with any federal law, which we would argue is further evidence that they tended to show that it applies to the military also and to everyone. Could it also be argued that they did it because they thought there was an omission and they were correcting it, and if they were correcting it, then in '88 then we can't put that back into 87, can we? That's I mean, correct. Most, most laws are corrected, particularly criminal laws, prospectively, not retroactively. That's, that's correct, Your Honor, but, we're, we're, but when it says it refers to this title and Title III, this title it's talking about is 21 U.S.C. 812, which is a title that the government argues the military has incorporated and assimilated into its laws under the Controls, in the Controlled Substance Act under Clause 3 in a 112A. <coughs> I'd like to get back just a minute to talk about the, uh, the government's argument about it, a derivative. <clears throat> uh, Judge Everett, you, you said you didn't think this could, we could uh, argue that to apply to the facts of, the, of this particular case. Now, factually, we're looking at, we're looking at a 112A offense. You know, Pellet was found, Pellet was found guilty of use and distribution of MDMA. Um, the elements are the same under whatever section of 112A, Clause 1, 2, or 3 we go under. Appellant agreed in his own mind on the record during the care inquiry that he took ecstasy. He agreed he distributed it. He agreed it was wrongful. Is Appellant on notice that he was charged under 112A? Certainly he was. Government at all times in this case argued that 112A was violated by Appellant's use and distribution, and Appellant knew that. Did he, by the way, ever conditionally or anything else stipulate that that uh, MDMA ecstasy is a derivative of one of those. No, he didn't, Your Honor. There's no, nothing to that effect. Nothing, nobody said that. Nobody but stipulated I that, did the they? the military judge said that a defense exhibit. The military judge. Which is appellate exhibit three, I the believe. The military judge queried the, def queried the defense counsel. He said, well, you, you introduced an exhibit, and I believe it was appellate exhibit three, the Toxie Lab News, volume six, number three. With the, we're in your exhibit defense counsel. It says that 3-4 um, methylene dioxide metamphetamine is a derivative of amphetamine. And why can't we go under that section? And defense counsel said, well, you know, we weren't introducing it for that purpose. And the government said, we agree that that's a purpose that it could go under, but we're primarily relying on Clause 3. But Beck, you know, to find appellant guilty under that section, there's no change, there's no increase in punishment, there's no change in the ingredients of the offense necessary to establish guilt. What different could the appellant done at trial? He's not going to be able to come in and provide a different, a different defense. I mean, he pled guilty anyway, even if he was going to plead not guilty. He can't come in and say, I didn't know, I, I didn't know it was ecstasy. I didn't think, it was, I didn't think but, it was punishable because I didn't think it was properly on the Controlled Substance Act. He can't, you know, he can't really say anything different in this case. We don't have the problems that we had in McKinley, where the military judge specifically ruled that it wasn't a char wasn't a um, crime, and the defense and prosecution both agreed it wasn't cr wasn't a crime. Now the government contend that to find it guilty under um, clause three would be no different, when the appellate courts consistently hold if an offense is necessarily included in the offense charged. They can find an LIO, and we really don't even have an LIO. We just have a twist on the same one. This is really no different than what the Air Force Court turned around and did in Lofton by finding appellant guilty of a controlled substance when the government's theory in that case was that it was a controlled substance analog. They said, no, it's not an analog, but it was a controlled substance, and we're going to throw out the government's argument on 21 U.S.C. 813, but we're going to find him guilty of a controlled substance. Counsel, what would your position be if, if the prosecutor in this case had, had charged him, instead of being real fancy here and charging him with the street name, and if just said possession and use of amphetamines, meta-amphetamines? You, you, you. I think they would have to charge it as a derivative, but they would have to say possession and use of a derivative of meta-amphetamine is how it should be charged. But all, de even though the language of this statute says derivative, all derivatives of the unlawful substances are not unlawful to possess, are they? 
No, a dr Couldn't you derive nitrogen from this chemical formula? Would you contend possession of nitrogen violated 112A? No, you have to have basically the same, you have the definitions of derivative, which provide you have to have basically the same chemical structure, just a, just one nitrogen the, atom the is The one that the you same. gave us in your brief says anything obtained or deduced from another, anything obtained or deduced from another. So if you had a lawful substance deduced from opium, it would not be unlawful to possess it, merely because it came from it, would it? But you also, but you also look at the, the um, parse portions of the definition, which in wreck it was that it was prepared from that drug, that it chemi chemically resembles but that isn't drug. A fundamental, which has the same adverse effects of that drug. Isn't a fundamental to all criminal due process is that a person is on notice that his conduct is unlawful. Yes. And if some diabolical chemist out there can manufacture a drug which gets kids dangerously high, but that drug is lawful, then that's society's problem. We have to enact it. We have to put it on the list, don't we? Or incorporate it through the Analog Act or, or have it be a derivative. Or incorporate it through the Analog Act. Okay. So I think the way out of this, it seems to me you have an argument that, that uh, 813 applies in the military under 112 is your best argument. I think I agree with that. Under 112 or under 34? Well, I hadn't come that far, Chief. The problem with she these, says it doesn't apply under 134. The, the problem with these designer <laughs> drugs, Counsel, and, and, and I like your, is that they're always from the, the brilliant chemist uh, or infamously brilliant chemist that invents this new drug to scourge our nation to the time that DEA and the and the, the law enforcement people discover that hey there's a new drug out it's called crank or ecstasy or uh, happiness too uh, or uh, there's a time lag there that there's no way that we can put it on the list because unless the chemist calls them up and says listen DEA I've just invented uh, uh, optimum happiness too a new drug in uh, never mind who this is but you better put it on the list because it's controlled substance there is going to be a time lag there where someone is going to be running around using this stuff crashing trains planes and automobiles or killing people under the, the influence of this and, and maybe that's why congress was so flexible in in 813 uh, I think that's exactly why in 813, and some of the legislative history indicates that's exactly why they didn't go through and try to, you know, specify out drugs. Because if they did that, then we still got the exact same problem but 813 but is trying the, to at prevent. At the time of the offense, as I understood your argument, 813 by its own language did not apply to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. It only applied to what titles? Titles. To, to Title I and three. It did not apply to Title X. No, that, it's not talking about Title 10. And in, We're talking and about in 21. March 21. of 1988, it was made applicable to all federal laws. November of 88, Your November Honor. November of 88. Okay. And so, should society say, well, the first 100 people that can use this drug that causes your my, brain to fry is not a crime until someone in DEA wakes up and gets a, a memo from somebody? Uh, branch chief that says put this on the list people are killing themselves over this drug I mean I I don't know if we have to wait for all the dust to settle and the dots to be crossed and the eyes you know or you know uh, the eyes to be dotted <laughs> and the T's crossed until until because uh, this guy pled guilty to a crime well anyway but in Yes. Our position is that the case can be deferred on either one of two grounds. First of all, you can treat MDMA as an analog under 21 U.S.C. 813, find a violation under paragraph 112A, under 112A, paragraph 37A, B, section 3, or you could find him guilty under Article 112A and treat MDMA as a derivative under paragraph 37A, B, 1. Unless the court has any further questions. That's we thank you, Major Taylor, thank and you for your much. prior advocacy as well when you appeared before us. Thank you, Your Honor. Captain Boyle. Thank you, sir. I'd like to address some of the items that came up during uh, Counsel, government's Counsel, could argument. you make sure you address my brother's concerns under 134, whether or not this should be 
treated under 134 by this court as as uh, as a as a crime prejudicial to the uh, sure, to sir. the armed forces. First, I want to uh, reiterate something that I had uh, stated earlier, uh, trying to paraphrase Judge Castle's uh, comments. I'd like to read from uh, its 28 MJ 671. On uh, page 675, he says, uh, this is Judge Castle, he says, if analogs are already covered as derivatives, and that's in quotes, of outlawed drugs, there would have been no need to revisit a half century of classifying drugs by their precise molecular structure and take a new approach in the Analog Act in 1986. Simply, I think that indicates that uh, a term uh, such as derivative would have been simple enough to allow a prosecution. They chose not to use such a word. They chose to use a more specific term. Judge Castle also makes a comment, and he talks uh, and tries to define the term derivative in that Tyhurst case. And he says, derivative is traditionally the same basic drug appearing in different form, yet having the same molecular structure as its parent drug. Perhaps uh, a picture is, can be Is painted. he limiting that to like hash hish as a derivative of marijuana? I think so, sir. And crack as a derivative of cocaine, so on and so forth? Another example, analogy would be a tree can become lumber. It can become paper. It can be, it's all derived from a tree. And it retains the same molecular structure? Yes. Let me ask you yes, this, sir. sort of following that up. I don't understand chemistry, though. <laughs> that's, that's pretty evident. But if you had some amphetamine and a good chemist, <laughs> Could that chemist, just using that without adding anything, turn it into ecstasy? No, sir. My understanding is that it cannot be by itself turned into ecstasy. It requires additional changes to it, to the chemical structure. And I, too, am not a chemist, but well, that's my understanding from what I've read. But isn't that what the analog was, the statute was made to, is, is not only to get the deri derivative, but in addition to if you put chocolate over amphetamines, uh, it's certainly not a derivative of amphetamines, but it's certainly it, chocolate-covered amphetamines. In that regard, I agree 100 percent with what you're saying. Okay. The only difference is, is the terminology and really what they meant. They're not synonymous. Derivative and, and, and an analog are not synonymous. I know. It, and the idea, that the government's intent to legislate to try to prohibit that clandestine Lex Luthor, that chemist who's out there trying to do something and make something a little bit better, uh, that's the intent. But the problem that we have here is that nowhere mentioned in 112A was there any reference at the time of this particular alleged offense was an analog or the term controlled substance analog incorporated. And the term derivative in that one category is not broad enough sufficiently pharmacologically or under Webster's to include that. Well, that's the premise that defense goes under. Captain Boyle, I just have one last question. Yes, sir. Could Airman Reichenbach been convicted in the United States District Court of Texas for possession and use of ecstasy? If pursued under 8113 uh, and they didn't have any challenges, I would think yes. So if he could have been prosecuted in the United States District Court of Texas, then he could be prosecuted under the third clause of 134? Perhaps, sir. Perhaps. But, as I mentioned earlier, my comment is that Article 112A, this is a catch-22 to some degree, uh, 112A came about to eliminate the necessity of having to go with the general article in 134 and to specifically deal with control, uh, to, to deal with control drugs primarily uh, and uh, in the manufacture, use, distribution, uh, and things of that nature. It was put there for a purpose, to take it away from 134. From what, yes sir? Well, I just wonder, you say to take it away, maybe to take it away from the first two clauses, but uh, preemption is a matter of legislative intent, right? Yes, sir. Why would we think that Congress wanted to preempt future legislation which might be adopted to deal with situations which were not within Article 112A. I mean, why would they want to do that? I, could, I don't have any answer for that, sir. Is there any honest. case that uh, you've come across where the doctrine of preemption has been applied by this court 
in a situation where one of the specific punitive articles, not Article 133 or 134, covered an area dealt with in, say, Title 18, uh, the regular federal code? Can you think of any? Nothing that comes to mind, sir. As, for example, a sedition or espionage or anything of that sort? I, I would have to do some additional research. Uh, and if necessary, I certainly would be willing to submit an additional brief if I if, could find something on if that. If you come across one, I'd, if either counsel does, I would certainly welcome that uh, being submitted because, uh, to me, that's a fatal flaw in your, your position, that this person could be, that he could be prosecuted in a federal district court under uh, 21 U.S.C. 813, which is actually mentioned by name in the specification here, and that you're saying that because Congress adopted 112A, which was designed mm -hmm. to expand the, broad, the law, to expand criminal liability, if anything, that he thereby gets a windfall of being protected from, from a prosecution that could exist in a federal district court. Well, that's the part that gives me the greatest trouble. I understand the rest of your argument. It makes yes, very sir. good sense. Well, the, the only thing that I can say in, res in regard to that is the government has the opportunity to select which form it wishes to pursue its case. And since Solorio, uh, they primarily are taking almost everything to court. This, you have to keep in mind, sir, was something extremely novel for the court at the time and for the, uh, the prosecution to try to allege an appropriate uh, an offense. What we're saying is that this was not an appropriate means of alleging an offense under the circumstances. And again, just to make one final comment here, uh, referring to Judge Castle, who uh, two com comments, who uh, said very interesting things, I might say. To paraphrase him at uh, page 674 of the Tyhurst case, he said, the Controlled Substance Analog Act was enacted in 1986, two years after the 1984 Manual for Courts Martial. No subsequent action incorporated Section 813 within Article 8, uh, 112A. And then, to make a very colorful comment, I'd say, he says, we refuse to read Article 112A as some type of military law Pac-Man designed to absorb every new drug law passed by Congress or ban every new drug mischief. And perhaps that's the situation that we have. Perhaps there is a remedy for future offenses. Certainly, MDMA, at the present time, is no longer an analog. It then falls under the purview of 112A solidly. But at the time, it wasn't. Uh, unless there's anything else, yeah, sir. Well, we certainly thank you for an interesting argument on both sides. And we'll take the matter under advisement and uh, render our decision in the near future. Thank you, sir. We'll recess for a few minutes. Los Angeles recess. You're watching a special series of programs on the United States Court of Military Appeals. Coming up in a half hour, a live call-in program with the Chief Judge Robinson Everett. But first, a look at the associate judges who sit on this court. We begin with Judge Walter Cox. Judge Walter Cox of the U.S. Court of Military Appeals. Our viewers have just seen an oral argument in your court. Tell us what it's like to sit up there to listen to the argument. 